Do you know how much you need to retire? Most importantly, do you have a plan to get there? The amount that you're going to pay in will feel a bit scary, but it should because we want a good one. So if you do feel a bit scared, don't worry, because today we're going to face it head on together. I feel like when people say the word sip, they feel like they're secretly trying to tell you they're rich if they've got a sip. I got a and sip. <laughs> <laughs> Humble flex. <laughs> so today we're joined by Lisa Conway Hughes, aka Miss Lolly. And just to read out your list of accolades. So you're a chartered financial advisor, a fellow of the Personal Finance Society, and also you're a member of Mensa. Can you just tell us what it's like being a member of Mensa, just to start off, first of all? Um, well, I don't interact at all, so I'm probably the, 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 a member that they don't even know about. But I just did it because it was, I just wanted to see if I could pass it, really. And um, my husband got a test your own IQ for Christmas one year and I just nailed it and I don't know why or how and I thought maybe that's a fluke <laughs> and <laughs> um and so I did the test just really to see and I was I was surprised that I passed as well do they give you like a certificate do you get like a medal secret handshake secret yeah. handshake yeah. Illuminati <laughs> access <laughs> well you can buy lots of merchandise if you wish discount at Subway you yeah. have like <laughs> a big check like with men men on it it really is nothing I get a monthly magazine that's it just it's say, really not. You are a genius. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, yeah. It's not. It, it's not as fancy as maybe it sounds. T, I got. A, I got. A, what I did before this was I got a Mensa question. Oh, okay. I'm going to put it to T oh. and the audience. I'll oh, read it no. out, and then the people pressure. can. Have, yeah, I knew you as well, so we can check if you're really <laughs> yeah, from Mensa. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, you can. You can have to the end of the episode. Okay. We'll, we'll add a bit of stakes to me. It's if you like can, the 1% club. Yeah. 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 To me, if you can answer this, I've got 50 pounds in my pocket. Hard cash. Hard cash. Okay. Yeah. And that'll give to you. So. Have you already told him the answer? No. No. No, no, no. He wouldn't do that. He's, 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 he's not that kind of friend. I'm, I'm banking on the fact that he will not get this okay. right. Like, you know. So Tabitha likes cookies, but not cake. She likes mutton, but not lamb. She likes okra, but not squash. Will she like cherries or pears? Don't answer it now. You can you can stew on that. I need a piece Do you know of the paper. answer? I read I, it again. I, th I think the... it might be the. F uh, no, no, do, do, don't don't give him any clues. No. Otherwise, you're liable. I'll pay, I'll pay. <laughs> you pay, you both got to pay me fifty quid. Tabitha <laughs> likes cookies but not cake. She likes mutton but not lamb. She likes okra but not squash. Based on those answers, would she like cherries or pears? You can sit on that. The chances of him getting this right are like him winning the lottery in my eyes. <laughs> the cheek of it. I'm going to get You've it right. You've got many talents, mate, but <laughs> knowing what Tabitha wants to eat is not one of them. Okay. You'll think I can see you thinking. We'll Spe come back to it. Speaking of the lottery, if you dig a little deeper into pensions and how much people actually need in retirement, mm. I think many people will think, oh my God, I need to essentially win the lottery to yeah. retire. Can we just start with a real big question of how much does a person need to retire? And so when I tell the answer to this, I think you've got to notice what your own reaction is because some people want to run a mile and bury their head in the sand or and think that I'm not saying it correctly or other people I think can sometimes be a bit frozen. But it's if you work out what you want every year and times it by 25, that's a good ballpark. So if I want a 10 grand a year, I'm going to need 250 grand. If I want 20 grand a year, I'm going to need half a million. And so when we're hearing at the minute, people, these rich people with a lifetime allowance problem of a million quid, these people actually are on incomes of around 40 grand a year. So I think there's a real, there's a huge disconnect, isn't there? About with a million sounds a lot and 40 grand sounds quite normal. Mm. Yeah, because the lifetime allowance is is the limit where if you exceed it, you get taxed quite aggressively, right? Yeah. So right now there's no tax, it's scrapped. But before that, it would be 55%. Um, and well, who knows? It's thought if we have a new Labour government that that will be re reinstated. Um, but yeah, I think there is a big, it, a million sounds a lot, but 40 doesn't. Yeah, well, that's it. So the idea is there that a pot of a million pounds would produce a sustainable income mm. of about 40 grand a year yeah. that would hopefully last you so you don't run out of money mm. towards the end of your life. Exactly. And 40 grand a year doesn't sound that much, does it, T? Not really. You know, I mean, no, not with my lifestyle, no. <laughs> spend that on lunches. Um, so, you know, like, I think most people want their life to be better in retirement. I think mm. many people think, I'm going to work and then in retirement, that's my golden years. And or some people just start discounting to make themselves feel better. Or when I when I'm, I haven't got, when I'm retired, I won't have a mortgage. The kids will grow up. We'll have one car, not two. But they don't think that actually you're on a seven day weekend. Yeah. 
Oh. And so you, so you actually spend you sat at work. You limit yourself yeah. from spending money. Whereas if you're in, you know, when you're on. A good example is like when I book time off to be with my son, mm. I just hemorrhage money yeah. because it's like I've got I've got to do stuff. I don't mm. want to sit and watch TV all day. No, it's like the, the newspaper can only bring you so much joy. Do you find <laughs> that people spend more in retirement than they think they will? Then I think people go two ways that they. Um, they feel quite liberated if they've done good financial planning or some people just can never switch themselves into spending mode because they've lived their life in accumulation mode. And then they, it's too much of a head mm, to actually switch into spending. So part of my job as an advisor is to give people the confidence in retirement to actually spend because it's in my client base, I see all extremes and it's so sad if you don't get that balance right. It's so sad if you work too late and don't take advantage of those years when you can travel and have fun. And it's so sad if you blow it all in Ibiza in year one and haven't got anything left. Yeah, but it'll which be a great year. Like, like, <laughs> great year though. <laughs> he had a very good first um, year in retirement, put it that way. What a guy. <laughs> yeah, my kind of guy. Just a beef for tops off. Like. <laughs> I'll never go back to work. Do you think it's changed a lot over time? Because like my grandparents, all they did RIP, they just traveled like mm. every, they were like holidays every month, like Nigeria to England, to America, to like France. But my parents are both still working. So do you think, it was like people used to- Easier. It was easier back then than it is now because, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a huge mountain to climb and sometimes it's a mountain we're just not willing to even look at for a while. And then the longer we leave it, the harder it is. And so it, the, the benefits that your grandparents had and my grandparents had was they would have had final salary pension schemes, but also a larger proportion, such a large proportion of their income wasn't going on property. Um, and so they had more to save. And people would argue this world of consumerism that we're in now wasn't around then as well. So they didn't have these financial pressures that we do now and being advertised two thousands of times a day. So in some ways it was different, um, but then presumably they were really sensible as well. I don't think we should take away from someone um, working hard, having a final salary pension scheme for 40 years. It's still a commitment to get. Yeah, and people made that commitment to workplaces for that reason, didn't yes, they? Whereas exactly. now we job hop. Yeah. Whereas people are like, no, the pension's good. I'm going to stay here mm. because mm. I know that if I stay here for 40 years, I get this good. Like like you say, they made that lifetime commitment. Yeah. It's not fair to say it was easy. They had better mm. structures that existed, but they yes. also working in one place for your whole life. The, I like that rule of, and I think it's really easy for people to say, times what I want by 25. How do people work out what they want? Yeah, and so... <sighs> You've got to remember that each year you've got to redo that calculation because things cost more the next year. So it's always a moving goalpost. But I think if you sit down and look at, well, what am I actually spending right now? And do a proper one, like not just a, a back of a fag packet go at it. Like a real, that's probably a really dated sen <laughs> sentence now, isn't it? People don't really smoke. But um, back of a vape packet. Yeah. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, but. It, it can't just be a guess. It's go th download your bank statements in an Excel we spreadsheet. We did an episode on this, didn't we too? Did yeah, yeah. brutal. And yeah. add it all up. And the same for credit cards or things that could be lurking in your PayPal or your Apple Pay. All of those things need to go in. And that is the number that you spent. Um, and, and, and start to work out, well, hopefully your mortgage will be paid off, but will it be? Because sometimes I get people calling me in real panic. So they thought their mortgage was going to be cleared, but actually it's not. What do, what do those people do? So really do make sure your mortgage is going to be cleared. The kids won't be um, financially dependent on you is a thing that people say often, but we all know about the bank of mum and dad. Yeah. Yeah. And we it's do know- It's pushing further and further, isn't it? It's like, it used to be at 18 C year. Now it's yeah. like 25, 26 and yeah. people still- and, and in London, I think um, 30 is I was gonna say in Nigeria home. and in London, people stay at home for like a lot longer yeah. and they like, yeah, they it, it's times are different. Yeah. I'd, like we met someone in uh, in Chelsea last night and like they, lots of people just live with their parents in like Chelsea, London, yeah. because they can't afford to buy in that area. So they just stay there and yeah. save money on rent. But they're all out at a bar spending 10 quid on a beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The live bank, life, the bank life, of mum and dad, the bank of mum and dad. I'm not saying the avocado toast is to blame, but it is funny. <laughs> like. um, one thing that was like a wake up call to me though, a bit of positive in this, I sat down to work out how much I'd need. And then I realized, oh, I won't be saving. You know, yes. a large portion of what I spend a month is savings. And, you know, I've really, I'm, I'm too far with it, but I probably save over 50, 60% of what, I, what I bring in. But that's because I'm just like, 
paranoid constantly that, that, that I'm not saving <laughs> enough. Most people aren't doing that, but it's still factor that in when you yeah. look at your budget go oh there's 10 to 20 percent here that i'd won't and i do think people can't help but save as well it's yeah. ingrained in them like some of my clients i really do have to tell them stop accumulating now is the spending years i wish i had that problem yeah i need to stop spending and start accumulating yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well you need to play a trick with yourself because i'm an accum i'm i'm a spender naturally and so i have to set boundaries which is the day that I pay myself the debt is the day that money goes into my pension into my ISA into my cash overpay the mortgage and just do all those like the annual I have to have little annual bills accounts as well for things that can crop up and then whatever is left I can just guilt-free spend I don't have to oh this old thing like I do love clothes and I do love shoes and I love holidays and so um yeah, I, I've found that balance for me to do what I need to do without feeling guilty. It's like managing, I say it all the time, it's about being good with money is about managing the ways that you're bad with money rather mm. than like, I'm I'm like you, I will just run through any money in my bank account. So I have yep. systems in place to make sure that I, I can do that in a controlled manner. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, okay. So the one thing that I want to look at, so we, we talked about how much people are needing the budget. The PLSA put out like guidance. <laughs> Sorry, sorry if I scared you. <laughs> what? She's like, what's that? Um, what is the, that's the buzzer to me. I don't know same. what is going on. Yeah. What is a PLSA, the please? The Pension and Lifetime Savings Association, okay. I think it stands for. And they, they provide guidance on what they think qualities of life look like. So yeah. just off the top of my head, you can correct me, Ruth, maybe from the back if I'm wrong. They say around a 10K a year is like the bog standard, what you need um, to basically just live. I think... 35k a year for a single person is comfortable and in the middle of that is like 25 26 that's currently now is an adequate lifestyle yeah but their their idea of comfortable is like one or two one two week holiday a year or this this kind of living standards and i think that was in the uk as well they say it? europe europe or you yeah UK one holidays. european holiday and like a uk city yeah. break one or two meals out a month this is like comfortable like their, their highest standards now you're saying 35K times it by 25. And I think honestly, most people listening to this would look at what comfortable is and say, that's worse than what I have now. Yeah. Um, the, the issue is that they then said the average pension pot at retirement is 55,000 yeah. pounds. And if you whack state pension onto that, the average person is in the bottom category. Yeah. Do you find that with your work? Well, sa sadly my work, is structured in a way that I don't see those people. Because um, you speak to people that have got that, cash. Yeah, people that come to me, a financial advisor in central London, they tend to have lots of money. Um, doesn't mean they don't have money worries, but they do tend to have lots of money. And that's the reason why I started Miss Lolly, because I thought if, if everyone could just learn one little thing about money every couple of days, then it's going to do some good eventually. We can get money confident. So, yeah, I did... I, I did feel torn about the fact that I use my skills to advise people who are rich already. Um, but but that's why you're here. That's, yeah. that's why I do what I do. I want to speak to the people that, that, that don't have the money to sit down with an advisor. That, because I firmly believe, you know, if given enough time, if you just have simple habits, like you say, mm. even a, a bit of money a month tucked away into the yeah. right types of structures over a long period of time can really change that. Exactly. And and I do set up these little one-off sessions for people to just pick my brains for an hour. And I think just have whether you learn that knowledge yourself or whether you pick someone's brain for an hour so that you're on the right track. And maybe you do that every couple of years. I think that constant nudging back on path, back, back on the right direction can really, really help. Can we can we do this then with Tomaine, if you don't mind, mate? Like mm. you're 35 years. 25, actually. <laughs> like, anyone who's watching this, I'm actually 25. He's yeah, lying. Yeah, okay. he's lying. <laughs> 35 years young. Um, and let's say hypothetically, he's got no no pension savings. Yeah. Um, where does he start? So my natural checklist would be, well, what, what tax bracket are you in? Because the more tax you pay, the more important it's going to be to do pensions because... Say, say you're earning less than 50,000, you pay in 80 into the pension, the government's going to pay in 20. Because percent. You're, percent, yeah, because yeah, you're a 20% tax payer. If you're, if you're earning less than 100, but over 50, you're a 40% taxpayer. So suddenly it starts to get 
a bit nicer because you pay in 60, the government pays in 40. If you're in that really dodgy bracket, which is 100 to 125, suddenly you're a 60% taxpayer. So you pay in 40 into the pension, the government's paying in 60. So I really want to see like, what can I, which bracket are you in? And what can we, what can we do pension wise to make you fall into a lower tax bracket. So a really good example is a lady's a couple of years away from retirement and she's she got in touch really to for me to help her sort of pension out. She's earning 80. So it made her feel a bit sick, but I managed to encourage her to do 30,000 a year into her pension through work and salary sacrifice because now she's a 50,000 pound earner. She's paying no high rate tax at all. And she's suddenly a 20% tax pay. So that would be my first thing. Like what, what can I do brackets wise? And then what's going on with the rest of your life? Because we do want pensions to be, we want you to sort out your pension and your retirement, but what are your commitments for the next five years? Because I think if someone's got loads going on, like they want to buy a house or IVF, that can be a really costly thing. Lots of women are contacting me about freezing eggs and all of those things. So mm. if if you don't understand what's going on in the first the next five years, they can distract you to the point where you're not going to do the long term. So I think you've got to find that balance. And then um, once I sort of felt I'd achieved tax efficiency for you, I would then start doing um, ISAs because everyone thinks it's just about pensions in retirement, but pensions are taxable. So you get all this tax relief, they grow tax free, but when you spend it, 75% of it's taxable. So say someone's wanting £60,000 a year in retirement, they take that out their pension, a taxable bit, they're, st- they're going to be a 40% taxpayer in retirement mm. again. So really you want to take 50 out of your pension if you want 60 grand, and then you want to take 10,000 out of your ISA because that's tax free. So having that flexibility of different pots with different tax wrappers um, would be my start. And also that ISA in the short term can then be there for medium term things like what, 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 commitments can you imagine you might have at 45 or 50 <laughs> yeah. 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 you're going to need a hair replacement oh I'll get lost yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's like it that's a uh, low blow <laughs> <laughs> After turkey for my teeth and my teeth, teeth and and hair hair and yeah, yeah. Oh, on that note, right? So, the you throw me that <laughs> it's like touching his head, like, is it still there? Is it still there? That's why I sit on this side because the ball patches this side. So, the what the question I want to ask there then is you talk about tax on the way out with the pension, mm. someone's going to say, Well, why don't I just use an ISA then? Because you don't get that tax relief on the way in, and it's a and, and so it, so say you're a basic rate taxpayer on the way in and the way out. The benefit is that it's only seventy five percent of it that's taxable on the way out. But also having taxable stuff in retirement isn't a bad thing because don't forget you've still got that personal allowance, yeah, so you you've can still, still take got a that twelve and a half Sorry, grand. You said only seventy five percent is taxable. Yeah. That's a lot. It is a lot, but when you think- You it's, can control how you take it. Yeah, yeah. you can take, so pensions used to be that you just get, gave away the whole lot to an insurance provider and they would give you an annuity for life. Now, the way I get clients to imagine it is literally like a cake and you take a slice every year. That could be a big slice or a small slice. If it's a big slice, it's not gonna last forever. If it's a small slice, are you having the quality of life that you really want? And out of that slice, 25% is tax-free. Okay, cool. So you can take out 20%, 20% yeah. one year and then take out- Or yeah. some people, like I've got a client who his dream is to buy this flat in central London and he needs a couple of hundred grand extra to do it. So we're slicing his cake to start with 25% out. Is that the lump sum that you can take at 55, soon to be 57? Seven, or, yeah. Yeah, because you can get a one-off lump sum. But are you saying that you can not take it as a one big cash you could take it every month as an income and still Forever. get that 25% benefit. Exactly. And so that has tax advantages every single year in retirement um, because you can control. Effectively, it goes into two pots, the tax-free bit and the taxable bit. And then you um, yeah, you take out how, how you wish. So you talk about your cake analogy and taking the slices. Like, How do people actually do that? Yeah. So... When I'm planning someone's retirement, in the in the run up, say three, four years before, we're really starting to get a grip of what does risk mean and what does what risk do they need to be taking? Because it might be a time where we start to really ease off the risk. 
or we might have the money you're going to spend when you're 80, 90 might continue to be higher risk, but the money you'll spend in your 60s and 70s might have a completely different risk profile. And then we want to build up your cash savings. So I always want clients to have three years worth of cash. And that just sounds weird to people, but one year is your emergency cash buffer. One year is for you to be spending in the year that you're in. And one year is for the year, the following year, if the, the stock market's crap. Yeah. Um, and then what we do is like a waterfall effect. I'm moving money, whether it's pensions, ISAs, general investment accounts, offshore bonds, onshore bonds. All this money is moving them from the higher risk long term stuff to the medium term um, stuff, and then into cash. And every year we look, say, well, what are you going to spend next year? What you what's your that five year time horizon? When do you need to replace the car? And then we're constantly topping up this short term cash pot from these longer term and medium term investment pots. So. So, and then we look, so we now know how much you need. And then we look at, well, how much should come from the pension? How much should come from ISAs? How much should come from your general investment account to use up your capital gains tax allowance? So it's a, it's a pile up of lots of different investments. And the government's always moving the boundaries of what's tax efficient. Now they've scrapped the capital gains tax allowance. Well, practically scrapped it to 6,000 going down to 3,000 next year. A general investment account just isn't as it's, as tax appealing as it was this time last year, but maybe off onshore but offshore bonds are becoming more popular. So I think it's just being able to be flexible. And the more pots you've created over your life, the more fle tax flexible you're going to be able to be. Can like so you're showing your knowledge there and and the value of of your services. Mm. Could someone listening now go, okay, I'm going to build up my pension, I'm going to build up my ISA, and then when I get near retirement, I'm going to sit down with someone like you who's then going to mm. help me plan how yeah. I take the money out. And, and weirdly, that's the stuff I love. Like I love working out what is the most tax efficient way for someone year by year. Because I think a lot of people just, they want to do it themselves, but then they hear yeah. that and they go, oh my God, how am I going to work that out? So yeah. a financial advisor can step in at the end and give that advice, yeah. you know. And exactly. Once people have got the pot. Mm. The, the one thing I want to talk about as well is um, state pension. Mm. The narrative is that's not even going to exist by the time I'm that age. How do you treat state pension? <laughs> In my mind, I pretend it's not coming. So I, I, I don't put it in my cash flow that I'm going to get it. I think of it's going to be some nice holidays, hopefully, if I get it's it. It's very nice to have. And, and I think, I mean, there's for people who don't have very much, I can't believe there'll be a day when the government doesn't look after people who don't have very much. So I wouldn't be worrying that that would go completely. But... Does it make sense that someone who has a lot of money gets 10 grand a year from the government? Um, I don't know. It, it just feels if, if some people are living in poverty and some people are living in excess, then that might be a way that we redistribute wealth when in, in retirement. Yeah. It's also obviously people pay a lot of, a lot of tax and then mm. to be told at the end, oh, well, you were too rich. Yeah. to get that is like a it's a bit of pill isn't it like you know I, yeah. you, I pay a lot of ni and i i have some clients who actually feel bad to receive the state pension they gift it to charity yeah. um because they yeah so i it's it's individual isn't it so you might think well i've earned it because i've paid my ni or you might think i've got more than enough so i'll give it away but i'd rather have pretended it's not coming and it'd be a nice surprise than it'd be great anything. weekend in ibiza yeah. That's not by the time weekend. you retire. Be, yeah, I can't keep it on like a weekend. Literally. Yeah. So T, have you been using Blinkist? I have indeed. Just for context, that's the service that summarizes books down into 15 minute, what they call blinks. So you can basically listen to that instead of reading a whole book. Uh, and be honest though, our producer Big Will gave me a discount code. I got a free trial. So. I did not get a discount code. <laughs> What's going on there? <laughs> oh yeah, you gotta get, you gotta be in it to win it. But um, I loved it. I genuinely loved it. It was, it saved me a lot of time. What's your favorite blink? The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. Mainly because I love to work for four hours, so a week, so it kind of gave me a bit of inspiration. Got a goal to aim for. Yeah, decent. No, I know, I love his podcast as well. Yeah. I, I wanted to test out some books that I'd read in the past that I knew really well. So I, I listened to The Richest Man in, in Babylon and I thought the summary was really good. That's a really basic personal finance book that's like, it's like the gateway for many people. And I think they summarize the key messages quite well because 
a lot of it's quite like up in the air fairy tale story really you, to get the core messages the blink was perfect um yeah blinkers is awesome if you're a busy guy like me a new dad head to blinkers.com forward slash making money after 45 day after seven days you get 45 percent off i think is the deal cheers mate appreciate spell you spell blinkist b-l-i-n-k-i-s-t impressive dot com yeah forward slash yeah making money that's us yes um <laughs> also the links in the description so yeah. if you don't want to listen to us you can just check it out okay now back to the show. Let's go. In a hypothetical situation then, let's say I've got an ISA, I've got my pension, I could essentially take 25% of a um, tax free. I could then take up to the 12 and a half grand mm. of tax ta- on like tax free income. Yeah. And then I could top up through my ISA yeah. and not pay on any tax on any exactly. of it. Exactly. Yeah. And maybe be pulling out 40, 50 grand a year there in that yeah. example. And that, and then if you've got other investments, you can use your dividend allowance. That you can you can be really tax efficient. So it is about collecting different types of things but the one that speaks loudly for for retirement is pensions because of that tax relief and for higher earners is it always going to be around there's all it's always banded around every year that rather than it being 20 40 60 45 tax relief that they're just going to make it a flat 30 and to be quite honest I agree with it because it means the lower earners that need it the most are going to get a 50 percent tax benefit Mm. Um, and those who are high earners already will get less tax relief, but they have less of a problem anyway. Um, so for higher earners, especially, maybe this is the golden time of the pensions as we know it, that you should take advantage. Yeah, get the money in. So yeah. the um, w- one thing that I get a lot on my channel is I don't trust pensions. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're talking about locking it away yeah. and f- lack of flexibility, how do you kind of, dispel that with your clients or I mean maybe not your clients but with someone saying I don't trust the pension system Philip yeah. Green robbed all the pensions blah like that kind so, of narrative so I think you've got to understand the story behind the headline and the government does not want pension scandals because that we they want people to have confidence in pensions which is why all the stuff that's going on at the moment with the lifetime allowance toing and froing is really bothering me because I think it it's legitimate pension scaring it is a reason um, how can I plan for 30 years when the governments exactly. are saying they're going to change it every five minutes? But anyway, that's a separate point. Um, I've forgotten what I was saying now. We were just talking about trust oh, and pensions. Oh yes, and trust and of- pensions. So trust and pensions were sort of rattled with um, with the Philip Green stuff saying that he put the money, rather than putting the money into the pension to make it secure and the defi- into the defined benefit pension, he kept it in the company. The the, the thing that probably wasn't mentioned in those headlines is the government will protect that up to 90% anyway. So th- they put these provisions in place so that it can't fall very far. Um, and that's only if you were, it's about 30 or thousand that up to the protection of 90. If it's below that, it's 100% protected. Mm. So most of those people would have been protected anyway. Um, and... Um, which is a relief, but it's never nice, especially if that's not explained to you. And then the latest one that's all over the news is uh, the British steel workers. And that was sadly my industry taking pensions from a defined benefit world, which means that defined benefit is like an NHS pension or a teacher's pension or a police person's pension. You, you, it's, it's dependent upon your salary when you leave or your average salary and it's dependent upon how long you work there for and then you get a guaranteed income for life how much you get is predefined the benefit is defined so defined benefit you know what you're going to get at the end and those cost a lot to run and that's why we don't have so many yeah they they don't do that anymore um, and so the, the British steel workers had these type of pensions um they're very very secure the other end of the spectrum is what most of us have now is defined contribution. I.e., You know what you're putting in, but you don't know what you're going to get out. What you get out is your responsibility to check how it's invested, how much is actually going in, is it the right amount? And so they moved these pensions from this world of defined benefit into the world of defined contribution. And it's coming to the surface now that they, that was predominantly driven by their, their want for fees rather than the want for doing the right thing. Um, and so lots of financial advisors who are involved in that are being shut down and fined and all sorts of things. It's, it's a big scandal, really. Um, so I think the lessons are pensions themselves um, are, are safe, um, that they can often be trust-based. So there's lots and lots of rules around who can t- who, how, when you can touch it, how you can touch it. 
Um, the bit that often makes people nervous is inside it is still an investment and you've got to get your head around that investment. And it, it is your responsibility. Now I've seen so many workplace pensions where big, big corporates and you'd imagine that their pension fund was a good one, but actually it's underperforming. So the way to look it up is ring up your provider of every pension you've got and say, what's the name of the fund that I'm in? And then just go to a website called Trustnet and type that in as well into the Google bar, press go, and it will bring up a fact sheet. And there's so much information on there. Geeky people like me love looking at it, but really what you just want to see is the one graph that's on the top left. And the graph will show you two lines. One is you and one is the average. And I think that's just an initial sort of acid test. Am I about right? Am I um, underperforming? Um, Am I overperforming? And a lot of pensions do underperform and you need to you need to know that and you need to find it out quickly. So I would check that at least every six months. And just kind of what it's invested in as well. I think like so many people that I speak to, it's like, this is going to be the biggest asset in your life. It's probably going to be worth more than your house. Mm. And you can tell me what your mortgage rate is, but you can't tell me what your pension is invested in. You know, and I think exactly. people just need to look under the hood, don't they? If, yeah. If you change your providers, um, you invest in something else, do you have to pay a fee So to like move it over? So the first thing is, so say I went with Aviva, um, in there I can have access to probably in most Aviva pensions, hundreds of different funds. And there'll be some Aviva ones, but there'll be other outside providers ones on the whole. So you can move usually without charge internally. In Aviva, but yeah. if you want to move to a different uh, exactly. insurance company, then, and then another if, different pension provider. If you want to move to another pension provider, so you yeah. say you're moving from Aviva to somewhere else, if you do that with an advisor, they will usually charge, well, they will charge you. Um, you can do that yourself often, especially if the pot's worth less than I think 30,000. Um, but then you want to be moving for the right reasons because your workplace pensions are probably going to be really, really cheap. Probably the cheapest pensions you can get your hands on. So if you're moving it to something else, it's probably going to be more expensive. So how do you justify that? And Often that can be because it's got more fun choice or maybe you've got an ethical viewpoint when it comes to investing and that's just not available within your current pension. And then I think um, another thing to be extra careful of, I nearly I saved a man from pension death the other week. He was going to move his pension. And so you know how I said most pensions have 25% tax free. If the pensions before, well, definitely the early 2000s, the 90s, it's worth checking how much tax-free cash you had because he had 98% tax-free cash. What was that just a feature of the pension? Yeah, and if he'd have moved it, it would have gone to the rules of the 25%. Wow. And um, there was a lot of money in there. So you've got to check. And the question to ask providers are, are there any guarantees that I would lose by moving my pension? And you want that in writing. Um, before you moved anything. Bef so we'll go into that in a bit more detail in a sec. What I think would be useful is just to talk about the different types of pensions, because mm -hmm. I know a lot of people sitting at home are going to be like SIP, work-based, you know, yep. um, state. So, we, so we've done defined benefit, defined contribution. So in defined benefit, you get final salary or career average. And that's just like it says, it's dictated by your final salary on the day that you leave or it takes an average of your salary. And these are always relating to your employer. Yeah, these with defined. that employer. And and the only people usually lucky to enough to have those now are teachers, NHS. Public sector workers. Yes, exactly. Um, or someone that's been in the company a really long time. And then, so everything else then, and then there's the state pension. So the state pension, you get a full state pension if you work 35 years um, and um, sort of pay 35 years of national insurance contributions. And if you want to find out how you're going or if they've got your record right, you can look at something called a BR19. Just put that into Google and it it's a very efficient service. It comes back straight to and it'll tell you, or you can go through your government gateway. And then the last one is defined contribution. So you get your workplace pension and you'll see these just called like a GPP means group personal pension. You can get a SIP, which is a self-invested personal pension. And I think SIPs kind of became like, I feel like when people say the word SIP, they feel like they're secretly trying to tell you they're rich if they've got a SIP. I got a and SIP. <laughs> <laughs> Humble flex. Humble brag as usual. David's always so modest. Massive SIP. <laughs> um, but 
it's not that way anymore. A traditional oh. sip. <laughs> <laughs> a traditional sip is there because it allows you to invest a self investment. And so often people would have them, let's say if they're a GP, they would buy their surgery, if they're a dentist, they would buy their practice in it. And you can hold whatever it is, as long as it's regulated within the, the, the SIP. Um, and that was the point of a SIP. They used to tend to be flat-based fees, so 500, 600, 1,000 pounds a year. So the more you had in it, the cheaper it was. And it just had what we would call in our, don't press the buzzer, open architecture. <laughs> it just mean you can invest in anything. Um, and then I think the pension industry sort of got onto this, that people like the word SIP. And so lots of pensions are SIPs now, but pensions, so some some SIPs, depend, it's dependent provider, but some SIPs will actually have less protection than a personal pension in them, um, which you just need to be careful of. But mostly a, a SIP now, a regular SIP will tend to have more um, investment choice than a standard one, but it tend to be more expensive as well, or can be more expensive it depends which provider you've got um but yeah mo most of the sort of standard providers that people are probably thinking about when they come and think about setting up their own pension i'd say like Hargreaves Lansdowne AJ Bell Vanguard, Fidelity yeah. Vanguard all of those they will do a SIP and and it, it's not it's not in the traditional sense of a SIP yeah so I'm self-employed now, so I, I have a SIP for that reason. But I had one prior to that because I worked for an employer. I got the matched contribution, mm. which we'll talk about in a, in a little second. But I knew that beyond that, the fee, I could do it cheaper through, I use yeah. Vanguard, but like you said, there's loads of providers. Yeah. Um, so I was I had my work based and then I was using the SIP to supplement it to, to bring up how much I was saving. Yeah. I want to first talk about the work based. Yeah. Will won't mind me calling out that when I first met him, he was like, I'm not in the work-based pension. I want my money. And I was like, you should probably get back into that because there's massive benefits around yeah. being in the scheme. Can you just talk us through how people can maximize the benefits yeah. of their work scheme? So often, so the, the the simple rule is with autumn enrollment, the rule is you have to put in five and the pet company has to put in three. And that's the, the simplest way. And then often companies go above and beyond that. So sometimes, so... So I was about to say company then, but I went. But often big workplaces will say, let's say if you put in five, they'll put in five. If you put in six, they'll put in six. You put like in seven. Like an benefit of working there, like they go so, above and beyond what's required. Yes. So the more you put in, the more they will put in. So um, you want to get the most out of your employer possible. You want to get as much of that free money as possible. So have a look. If you pay in more to your pension, will they pay in more? And ideally go for it. Um, often a couple of percent reduction in your take home pay won't break the bank whereas it's going to make a massive difference to the amount that you have in retirement and people can just ask their hr department yeah. you know what do you contribute yeah can i up it yeah. yeah well so you can definitely up it yourself as well but will they pay more if i up it and then you can up it yourself um and often a word that gets talked about is salary sacrifice and i don't think people know what that means necessarily um and what it means is let's say i let's say that lady um, with the 80 grand, we've asked her employer to salary sacrifice 30,000 pounds of her money into her pension. And that means she pays no, she pays tax and NI on 50,000 because the, 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 the employer is effectively not paying her that 30, they're putting 30 in the pension, paying her 50. So she pays tax and NI on that um, 50,000. The other way you can do it is you pay into the pension. The pension assumes that you're a basic rate taxpayer. And then if you're a high rate taxpayer, they owe you 20%. So you get your tax back, but you're never going to get that NI back. Mm. Um, but the problem is you've got to be careful because if you salary sacrifice into a pension but want a mortgage, often the mortgage will only be based around that new lower salary, in this case, 50,000. So you've oh. got to be certain that it's the right thing to do and that it doesn't impact your work benefits too much. So we, we know about the the 25 rule and we know that people we hear this 15 percent. i've also heard rules of you know save half your age and yeah. things like this and one thing that's important is you you can save more so if you struggle when you're 20 when yeah. you're 50 you can be throwing loads in how much should people save a month well it it to know the true answer you need to use a, a 
a pension calculator and there's loads online J just go to a provider site rather than the state pension one and you can you'll say if I pay in this amount every month this is my salary what am I on track to get but I do think the half your age is a, is a nice benchmark for, so is that like of an asset you split your age in half and that percentage of your percentage salary yeah. you should save so I'm 42, so I should be putting 21 in, 21%. And that's with, again, with all in, with the tax relief, with mm. your employer match, with all of that. So it's not just 20% of yeah. my wage. Is but it? it also doesn't mean that's going to be the the solution. You've got to make sure you're in the right investment. It's a combination of so many different things, but I think it's a good, it's a good sense. But also... When people invest, I often find, especially women, um, will be overly cautious because they think this is a really important part. I better be careful with it. But actually being cautious can be very risky. So while you're young, let's say you've got 10, tw let more than 10, maybe even more than 20 years to go until you spend the money. You want to take the most amount of risk that you feel comfortable with because the difference between getting... So I have a client yesterday and I ran a cash flow model for him for his lifetime. If he gets um, if if he gets um, one point eight percent a year return, he has enough money um, to live until ninety. If he got two point five percent return, bearing in mind he's seventy, all the way, he would have enough money to live all the way until a hundred. So that little percent extra and, um, g gives him eight more years of money. Yeah, and that's and and the key thing is at eighty seven, you can't work. No, you, know, you, you, you need can't that fix money, that right? Like, you, yeah, the the. I want to talk about this because people are going to go today after this and they're hopefully going to log on to their pensions and they're going to look what's in there. And mm. one issue, call it an issue, that I have with the way it's framed is the, the labels they apply to funds. They call mm. them like adventurous. And I think most people's idea of adventurous is like jumping out of a plane. <laughs> yeah. When in reality, it's, it's not that, is it? You know, no. I'm 100% equity, which means- Yeah, me every, too. Yeah, there you go. 100% in the stock market. I don't mm. have bonds because I'm young enough to know that over 30 years, say, of how long I'll be investing, that the stock market tends to produce better returns. But I think this label of like moderate, adventurous, yeah, low balanced risk. balanced feels very sensible, doesn't it? Yeah, it's it? like, oh, I'm balanced, yeah. yeah. But, you know, you, adventurous, it's not It's not like high-octane stuff, is it? It's, no. it? It should be more... No, and if you want to dig a bit deeper, that website, Trustnet, is a really good place. So I talked about that graph on the top left. If you just scroll down, there's some pie charts and it shows you how it's invested and it'll show you your top 10 holdings. And often they're in very, very big, big corporate companies mm. that if they go bust, then we've all got very big problems. Uh, <laughs> quick question. Yeah. All these benefits are for people who are employed. Yes. Are there any pensions for like self-employed people? You can or have any, any pension whether you're employed or self- I know any like benefits self for self-employed um, people. Only, so, so if you're self-employed in that you're um, like a sole trader, the benefit is that it will help you control the amount of tax that you pay. So often, and we know that self-employed people do not pay enough into pensions. Um, I can't- Guilty. I think it's about 16%. Yeah, sorry, Caroline's, Caroline's guilty. Oh, everyone's guilty, <laughs> except, except for this guy. 16% yeah. I think of self-employed actually pay into a pension. 16%? Yeah, 16%. Yeah, I'm not part of that 16%. Pay in. Yeah. So we need well, to get you started yeah. then. I think, I think people are just like, so in their business, aren't they? And yeah. it's like, I need the cash flow. I need to go to Because when I was yeah. work, when I was employed, I- they yeah. had like, like company pension and everything. I've still got And that, it was done for you. It was done for me, so it's easy. Yeah. But now I'm like, uh, wow. I've got bills. I want to go on holiday. Yeah. I want to buy a new car. So yeah, there's all these things that get in the way. And then exactly. And you're not kid, alone. And then you don't have, yeah, you're like, well, and you're worried, worried about your business as well. So yeah. you might reinvest and, in and the I business. And I think it's that, the, the fluctuation. I remember at the very beginning, of, when I was in my 20s, when I had just starting out my client base and my income was all over the shop and it's really unsettling. And at that time, I was like, I can only commit to 100 quid a month into my pension. And I did it, but I really wish I'd done more. Um, so the way I, the, the mind game that I play with clients who are self-employed is we do the minimum that they know they can definitely afford come rain or shine in their business. Then every quarter I give them a nudge. So I've worked out. So every client will know their number, right? You owe your future self this every year, but let's do the monthly that we know you can afford. And then every quarter, I'm going to give you a nudge to try and do a quarter of the difference, another quarter of the difference. Um, and so they can see if they're going off track. And so 
And then at the end of the tax year, it's then taking a step back and say, well, how much did you actually end up earning overall? And how much should we put in your pension just to be that little bit more tax efficient? Um, so I think that's the right way to do it if you're self-employed. If you're a limited company, the benefit is it reduces your corporation tax. Yeah, that's me, um, yeah. So I would... Same same approach because your corp, your company income can fluctuate, but yeah, do an amount and then when you when, as you grow your business, well, if you're like me, I like to feel almost in a sense of scaredness that oh my god, if I do max it out this year, like so the pension allowance this year is now sixty thousand for this year, it was forty thousand for last year. Do I have twenty thousand extra? I don't know, but I'm, I, I did it. Yeah, you're just going to, and it's like, I'll deal with the consequences, yeah. put you back against the wall a bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I think pension planning should feel a bit scary. The amount that you're going to pay in will feel a bit scary, but it should because we want a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Like I often say to people, I get this comment all the time. It's like, oh, I'm not going to live to 60. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to, I'll be dead by then. No, it doesn't matter. But actually, if you look at the stats, you're yeah. far more likely to actually reach, you know, 80 odd than you are to, mm -hmm. to die young. And if you want to depress yourself, there is actually on the Office of National Statistics, um, a, lo a, a longevity calculator. Ooh. And I you love can depressing myself. Can we put in how many beers you drink a week and like how many shots of tequila you do? do, you, do I also just come back, you should be dead. <laughs> How were you deceased four years ago? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, the 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 best place to be a man is Richmond upon Thames. The average man in Richmond lives till ninety two. I live quite close to Richmond. There you go. Oh, My okay. uncle lives around there. Yeah. I'll 92. help you spend your pension if you haven't finished off. Yeah, I'm in the north of England, and we we I think the stats are bad yeah. on the north. Yeah. And, and some parts of Scotland are especially bad. It's my pie habit. I'm like really into pies, <laughs> pie and mash. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So just to round this off now, what I'd like, I think you've given loads of information. Thank you. And it's we've been really clear. I just want people to have like actionable steps that they can walk away with. What can they do today to kind of like get on top of this? So I think number one is understand that your pension providers work for you. So call them up, ask them all the questions, make them explain it to you, find out what fund you're in, find out the cost of your pension. So what is the total expense ratio of my pension? Um, and that just is industry jargon for what are all the charges? Like don't leave a single one out. What are all the charges of my pension every year? And just, so that's the first thing, get familiar and get in touch with your pension. I think a really good thing to do is to track your um, net worth every month. Mm. So I try to do it the first week of every month. I have to do it tomorrow, <laughs> otherwise I've broken my own rule. But um, I put down all my assets, all my um, debts, and then see my total net worth every month. And I, I have it with my home and without my home because I don't want my home to give me a false sense of security. Yeah. And then I um, have my... 25 times number in yellow, in bold at the far hand right of the spreadsheet. And then I can see what percentage um, I've made. For the record, over. it's 25 times because we're meant to live for 25 years retired, right? It's meant, yes, oh. it's similar, it, yes. But also it's that if you have an investment, it wouldn't be unreasonable for it to grow 4% a year. And so you could take 4% out every year and maintain that, that Kind of it's the four percent rule. It's something yeah. called the Trinity study that looked at what a safe withdrawal rate is from a pot of cash. And all they mean is if you take a percentage each year, what's the chances that it will last you through retirement? There's they, they now think maybe it's like five percent or three percent. I, I work to three percent because just, just I, to be safe. Yeah, yeah. I want to potentially retire early mm. and I want to base it on the fact that I'll live to a hundred because I'm an yeah. optimist, I don't want to die. <laughs> so you know, I, I work to three percent. Yeah. Would that mean that I times it by thirty-three? Come on, yeah. Mensa. Come on, Mensa. 33. <laughs> you should be thinking about Tabitha, mate. So that, that's coming up soon. Oh, yeah, I think, I've, I, think I know you what think it you is. Know it. Yeah, you, 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 you can give the answer after he does. Okay. okay. I and could then be really wrong. The, the, another question that people are going to ask mm. is, I work to eight different employers. I've got pots everywhere. Should I be bringing them all into one pot? Like Pension B mm. seems to be everywhere, this company. I, I hear their name banded about all the time. It seems almost like really on the forefront of people's minds to consolidate? You know, yeah. What do you think about that? So I think a lot of these pension consolidation companies, it's a good idea to know where they all are. There's so many pensions that are lost. It's billions of pounds of pensions. Do you just call your previous employer? So you or? can Google, um, trace my, it's 
track my pension, but you've got to be really careful. Make sure it's got .gov on it because loads of scammers yeah. then try and get your pension mm. details and they nick them. So make sure you go on the .gov website, but it's track we'll my pension, that. trace my pension. And then putting them all together is a good thing, but often these consolidation companies are just tracker funds dressed up quite expensive. Um, so you you might not want to go, you might want to do it yourself and find, if you're going to be a tracker, then go with a true tracker provider. I, I moved all mine into a Vanguard SIP and just bought yeah. bought the tracker funds myself. Yeah. I didn't need a company to do it and doing it internally on, on their website or any of the big platform provider websites, super easy. And I'm not allowed to recommend funds, but for example, Vanguard do have the sort of we've done it for you type of funds, which are called their life strategy yeah. funds. I use a global index, which yeah. is, you know, again, same, but you can really drill it down on there. Yeah. Like if you want to just buy the S&P 500 or whatever, yeah. but you can even, but you can even screen ethically as well. Yeah. ESG yeah. funds. So yeah, I would just, yeah, if you're going to be a tracker, then I would be a true tracker with a true tracker provider. So just before someone goes away now and consolidates all their pensions into one, can you just talk about some of the things they should look out for and the potential pitfalls? Yeah, so one of them is like we were saying with those British steel workers, do you realise that you're taking money from a defined benefit to a defined contribution? Do you really know what that means? Um, another one is who is actually benefiting? Because consolidation can be a good thing, but if you're paying big advisor fees to do it, is it genuinely moving you forward in the right direction? Um, so just be wary of if you're if someone is if someone makes money only if you move your money, that it's going to be the right thing. And then you've got to be careful of guarantees that you can lose. So the tax-free cash we've mentioned, um, other things would be guaranteed annuity rates, protected retirement age. So right now the retirement age is 55, is going to 57. Some people have protected retirement age at 55. So even if the rules become 60, you can still take it at 55. Do you want to know a random trivia if you're a deep sea diver or a pen or a um a footballer you don't have a retirement age of 55 it's just whenever you can touch your pension whenever you want because they're like the most well footballers obviously they retire young and deep Why sea deep divers sea? they don't live very long <laughs> really? it's the most dangerous job on the planet yeah. is that they actually? get paid they money they get paid a lot yeah. well they just like run out of auction or get eaten by sharks it's or your brain yeah so like going up and down yeah they, it's super, they, <laughs> yeah. they go into like pipes to like oil pipes they're really deep down yeah. they get oh, man, that sounds yeah. very claustrophobic yeah. and very I, it, very stressful yeah. even with the unprotected retirement age it wouldn't be me <laughs> yes, yeah no. thousands a day they can earn yeah. right and some of the ones where they have to like sit in the chambers below the sea they're down there for like a month because of all of the nitrogen I'm sure about that yeah and, and then it takes yeah. them ages to come yeah, up exactly. they come up really really get slowly paid, get paid loads but yeah the, like I think the careers are short and that's probably why they, they retire young for some more. reason of all the pension stuff books I've learned that always sticks in my head deep sea diamonds that's, that's so yeah. good so let's just do this question then I'm going to read it one more time for you Tamayne um, like that will help <laughs> <laughs> Look, just make sure you've got that 50 pounds ready for me that's what I'm saying oh, I, Ta I, Tab okay. Tabitha likes cookies but not cake she likes mutton but not lamb she likes okra but not squash will she like cherries or pears you, you can't just guess you gotta say I will tell way. you why she will like cherries because she likes mutton over wait what does she like <laughs> cherries she like, cherries she like, is my final answer she likes cookies answer. but not cake okay so cookies are smaller than cake Okay, mutton but not lamb. What she? I know that doesn't work, does yeah. it? Uh, <laughs> I was, okay, uh, that is a tricky one. I still stick with my. my yeah, answer. but I need a reason because it's fifty-fifty, mate, and there's money on the line here. You can't just go on guessing that. Uh, yeah, I think you're really close. If I'm right, no. I think you're quite close. I'm going to say you didn't get it, which is a relief because I don't have fifty pounds. <laughs> 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 the fact that you wouldn't get it right. <laughs> it. it was right though. My answer was right, but my yeah, my logic your wasn't. Your answer is right. Do you want to take that? I think is it because Tabitha is T A B I T H A, so seven letters, and cookies, mutton. Oh my god! Oh no! Okra. Oh no! Okra. Oh, oh. Oh, go on, Will. I can go see you're out of be desperate to get in here. Go on. Is it the two syllables? It is. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> two syllables. But that she's is three syllables. Mutton. No, 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 the foods. The foods. Um, Cookies, mutton, okra, and cherries. Oh, that is uh, two syllables. I still said cherries. You owe me twenty-five pounds. No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> bonus. Bonus question. What does meant? You can't answer this. What does meant to mean? What does the word meant to mean? I've got no idea. There you go. I did Latin GCSE. It means. <laughs> 
I don't know. <laughs> oh my God, table. Does it? Yeah, but it's like, it was like a gathering of the minds around the table. Around the table. Yeah, like this. Yeah, like this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> gathering of smart minds around the table, just like this. Thank you very much. <laughs> wow, that was a lot of information, wasn't it? Just to help you out, we've put together a bullet point summary of everything that was in the episode in this week's newsletter. You can sign up to the newsletter just using the link in the description that's below. 